Hi everyone, I and welcome to the ECR webinar on forecasting skills in the industry, brought to you by Canaxis and the ECR. Before we start, let's go quickly over who we are. I'm Margaret from ECR, the Early Career Researchers Group of the International Institute of Forecasting. My fellow ECR members are Anna, Sarah, Michael, Niles, and Sherry. As a team, we support early career researchers in their career development by organizing events, webinars, and talks at the annual International Symposium on Forecasting. Polly, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. <laughs> As you can see here, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and keep an eye out for interesting career opportunities and events we organize. Feel free to take a quick screenshot of this slide uh, so you can look us up later. Okay. We are super excited about uh, today's webinar, and we have two fantastic speakers. Both are from Canaxis, a company that works on supply chain solutions closely linked to the academic world. They are here to talk about the important career skills in forecasting in the industry and how to use your PhD experience. We are very pleased to welcome Polly Mitchell Guthrie, the VP of, the, of Industry Outreach and Thought Leadership at Canaxis. We also welcome her colleague, Anne-Flor Ellard, Director of Adventure Analytics Service. Polly and Flor, thank you so much for making time in your busy schedules to share your knowledge today. So let's start. Polly, the floor is yours. Obrigada. Thank you, Margarete. Thank so, you. A couple a couple, a couple of things first, just that I want to make sure you understand about the platform we are using today. Uh, uh, in order to join the audio, you can choose to use your microphone and speakers if you want to connect through your computer, or you can choose a telephone option to dial in directly. Um, we do not have a chat feature, but we do have a questions panel, so you can see that on the on the right here, and you may, can submit questions throughout the conversation we are having today and we will save them to discuss at the end. And finally, the webinar is going to be recorded so it will be available on demand later. And with that, we are going to start with a pop quiz. So the question is, and you're going to have a chance to, uh, to answer this in a poll, but let's say that you are looking at forecast accuracy, a rate of 90.8% for October, and 90.3% for November. The question is, what do these numbers tell you? So you have three choices for your, for, your, uh, for your answer. The first is that your model is degrading and you need to improve it. The second is that your performance as a planner is suffering and you need to figure out what's wrong. And the third is you're doing really well in your forecasting. So please uh, select one of these choices now so that we can have, uh, have that as part of the conversation. You may choose one of these three options if you are attending live. And we will show you the results as soon as we've heard from, uh, from everyone. So please make sure you pick one of these uh, selections. Excellent, thank you. So uh, about 20% uh, of you said the model's degrading, 20% said your performance is suffering, and the majority said you're doing really well in your forecasting. So uh, great answers and we will talk more uh, about this as we go along, but um, this poll is a result of a conversation I had just yesterday with a partner of ours 
who reminded me that he, he was literally in a presentation where he saw these numbers on a screen and the reaction of the business leaders in the organization was, what's wrong with our planners? Their performance is suffering. There's something wrong. They're not doing well. We need to improve their forecast. However, I know that some of you who have, uh, who are very interested in the, the mathematical modeling part may look at this and think, oh my goodness, the forecast is, the, the model is degrading. I have to figure out what's wrong. I have to go fix it. And what Anne Floor and I will talk to you about today is that it's really more about the overall business domain. With those numbers, you're doing really well. And the question is, what else do you need to think about? So that's what we'll talk about today. So we're going to tell you just briefly who we are. We're going to talk about what forecasting looks like in industry. What does it look like in practice to actually do forecasting, not just the roles, but doing it, the kind of skills you need, what you should know when you're applying for jobs in industry, how to prepare for interviews, and how to act like a pro. And we'll leave time for questions at the end. So just uh, three things briefly about me. The first is that I live in the desert in Scottsdale, Arizona. The second is that I've been very involved in uh, two professional organizations, INFORMS, the leading society for advanced analytics and data science and operations research, and Women in Machine Learning and Data Science. I co-founded the third chapter, and there are now over 100 chapters around the world. And uh, the fourth thing is that I have a strong background in analytics and practice. And I'll let Ann Floor take it from here. Thank you, Polly. Um, so briefly, um, as well about my background, so I'm based out of Toronto. Um, I've been in data science and analytics for the past 12 years, um, and I'm really passionate about the application of MLAI data science um, in the business. As you know, it's been a, um, a journey for the past 10-15 uh, years, finding ways and better ways to um, extract uh great um you know power and impact from those new techniques and this is really something that um keeps me up at night um if we go perhaps to the ne next slide um what we uh wanted also to to present a little bit before getting started in the real topic is kinaxis so kinaxis is a leader in uh, supply chain and business planning. So this is the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with. And it's really centered around a key product called Rapid Response, which is a platform um, that is extremely uh, configurable and this is really the strength. And another thing as well is that Kinaxis pioneered the concept of concurrent planning, if you heard about it, uh, making sure that in the business the different teams that contribute to the planning um, collaborate and see the same views almost immediately. And that is um, a, a lot thanks to in-memory computing. Um, but between the demand planners who forecast demand, the supply planners who uh, forecast at a more granular level, all that transition and end-to-end -end integration is really enhanced a lot by what we call concurrent planning. If we go to the next slide, um, um, Kinaxis is um, present across multiple industries. Um, so both supply chain planning forecasts uh, are applied all through those seven industries, and um, we have the trust of quite a few key uh, key names in the uh, in the world. Um, going to the next slide, so what we'll talk about. Um, today, uh, and I'll introduce this and, and uh, uh, Polly will um, deep dive into those topics, uh, is forecasting in the industry. And what are the, uh, you know, what do forecasters do in the, in the industry? And um, there's like two key, um, in my experience, like two key uh, groups. And those are not siloed by any mean, like uh, I actually have been in product roles and in practitioner roles. I have a preference for practitioner roles, um, but you know, that's why I have those arrows here. Like you can definitely switch from a group to another. I'll start with the first group, the practitioners. Um, most of the time, like for forecasting, you have like industry, uh, you know, industry uh, roles where you actually forecast for a company and then you have um, like um, consulting or professional services 
uh, like in Axis, for example, where we provide forecast services for those companies. And this is what we call client-facing roles or internal roles in the industry directly. Like if you're forecasting directly for your company um, and have a role as a forecaster or a planner, this is like an initial group of roles that where forecast is, is very much used. Um, and the common theme between those groups is that they focus on the application of forecasting techniques for specific business problems. How much am I going to sell uh, next month, in two months, in three months for every single product at every single different site for every single client that I have? Um, what are the trends basically and how if I roll them up at the group level for my company or at a market level, how does that look like? Um, and so this is really like the type of questions where multiple techniques from statistical forecast to machine learning techniques like tree-based algorithms. In sometimes there's like some uh, elements of reinforcement learning that are starting with the trend of the, um, you know, uh, self um, like driven enterprise, like cognitive applications of that include forecasting as well, but mostly uh, from statistical forecast to regression techniques to tree-based uh, techniques. So this is that initial um, that initial uh, group, um, and it's really focused on accuracy. How accurate your forecast is? What's the impact? If you have a very accurate forecast. It means it can mean two things. Number one, if you were over forecasting a lot, you would have a, a lot more inventory because you wouldn't sell as much as what you would have produced, let's say. Your demand plan would have told you to that you would sell 500, so you produced around 500, and let's say you sell only 100, then the difference has a cost because you have to store that excess production. And and so in that case, having a more accurate forecast, let's say you predicted 150, is actually um, a lot of savings for, for your company. That's business impact. On the other side, um, if you forecasted 100 and you actually were going to sell, like the demand was 500, then you were short by 400. And those are missed sales opportunities. You could have sold 400, but you did not. So, so that's missed revenue. So if you had said, okay, well, I, I think we're gonna, my forecast predicts we're gonna have 415 demand and you were at 500, then your missed revenue would have been much lower. So that's the, that, that's the goal of an accurate forecast. That's the business impact behind a proper forecast. Um, on the other side, you have the product roles, um, which are more focused on building the next generation of software. So it's more research and development. Uh, product management, machine learning engineers who are working on configurability of the forecast, what kind of techniques do we have, and the performance of those forecasts within the product as a whole. So making sure that um, like the companies that use forecast have you know, the best product possible and the best forecast uh, available to them to, to apply to those business questions. And that will include certain questions such as interpretability of machine learning forecasts. Um, like that this is like very a very key topic, like machine learning, tree-based, or even more like for uh, deep learning techniques, definitely has been uh, known to not necessarily be that explainable or that easily explainable. Uh, if you compare it to let's say regression techniques which has different variables which, which can be like a bit more traced so we are using like different kind of tools right now lime and chat diagrams elements like this so um, that's typically like a product question how do i include interpretability into my forecast in my tools so the planners or the forecasters who will use those tools will be able to understand what drove the model to forecast what it forecasted and those are a few examples. Um, and to give you like a little bit of a, a quick story here, and uh, that's something that Polly will mention um, a little more as well. Like um, when Polly said, you know, there's a lot of elements around the business. Like those two groups actually work very closely together um, in the sense that if the product uh, has the math right, it's not, it's not the, the um, it's not necessarily sufficient. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was working uh, a few years ago, 
I worked with a group uh, of researchers. And among other things, they were really passionate about Q-learning at the time and really wanted to implement those kinds of models. In reality, um, we needed to, from a business standpoint, we needed to understand how do we productionize those. Are we able to put them in production? How, how, what, is, what is it going to take to put such models in production, to automate them, to maintain them? And do we have the skills also and the techniques to also be able to maintain them over time to sustain that value? So there's a lot of boxes around math that from a business standpoint, need to be thought through and need to be right. And, um, you know, from the infrastructure required, from the maintenance, from the support, from the different users that will actually consume um, that information and we will want to understand it and explain it and know why, uh, you know, we have 100 in terms of forecast and not 150. Um, so those are key considerations. And I will hand it over to Polly to go deeper into that topic. Thank you, Anne Floor. So we'll talk more about some of the things Anne Floor just mentioned, but I want to start with uh, a really a, a headline that that really stuck with many of us from uh, from last year, and that was in the fairly uh, immediate <clears throat> aftermath of the beginning of the pandemic. The the chief supply chain officer from Unilever, who many of you may know from some of the products you see in little rectangle there, uh, they're in the consumer packaged goods industry. And the other thing to know about Unilever is they are typically considered one of the leading supply chains, uh, having really mastered the skills at supply chain. And their um, chief supply chain officer, Mark Engel, uh, made this comment that agility beats forecasting when the supply chain is stressed. And what you, what you learn more about if you read this article is he was talking about how they had to be so agile trying to figure out what was happening in the market. Naturally, their, their forecasts were pretty useless at that point in time because the historical data was not relevant. They had to change their planning horizon from instead of planning every 13 weeks and moving forward from that, backwards and forwards from that point, they had to shift to four. They moved from planning weekly to planning daily and took a lot of agility. And his comment was that forecasting was less important than agility. And that's because, especially in a time of disruption like that, a forecast is really only one piece of what's happening. And it's also only one point in time. Uh, but that being said, as the example Ann Floor just gave, if you forecast 100, but you needed uh, 100 versus 150, that, that difference can really make, uh, uh, make an impact on the supply chain and better better accuracy can improve planner productivity and help synchronize supply chains. So we're really talking about walking a balance here between the fact that the math is not all we're doing, but the math really matters and is important. So to give another uh, example of this, Anne Floor talked about this uh, again in, in the example she gave, but the, uh, I'm thinking of another example we have from a uh, client we were working with where we gave a forecast, the accuracy was pretty good, uh, but when we shared the forecast with this particular company, which was um, essentially offering, uh, operating in a very fast moving business, a, a food and beverage business, I'll say, um, they said, um, it, it doesn't matter how accurate your forecast is, in this case, we can't ever under forecast because basically we can't ever be out of food. Uh, but Anne Floor, I know you've talked about examples you have seen where, uh, over forecasting is, can be a problem as well. Uh, so do you want to mention an example of that? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. So in terms of uh, um, over forecasting, um, we, um, so we have companies, you know, um, who have limited space and, and inventory uh, storage. And um, if we basically over forecasting, let's say, and your um, cost of storage is about 9% of your price, um, then if you over forecasting so much, and there are sometimes also in supply chain incentives to sandbag a little bit and you know, make sure that you have a lot of, a lot of inventory. Um, so you have like first a huge cost, but then we had another um, company we worked with um, where we focused on salad bags super perishable goods. 
everything that you over forecasted that gets stored after two, three days, basically it's a write off. And you would be surprised how um, expensive that can be. Um, and on the other side, if you have under forecasting, there are some companies who have told us there is no way we're missing any sales. And so we have also to adjust models and sometimes to actually push them to over forecast a little more and not under forecast at all. So there are really like constraints in terms of business that will impact the way um, we need to forecast. Thank you, Anne Floor. So uh, another risk that can go wrong with a perfect forecast, think back to our numbers at the beginning of the of our talk, is if you have a failure of adoption. And you can have a failure of adoption for several reasons. Uh, one is if your incentives are misaligned. There is a great paper I recommend by uh, Fields and Goodwin from the International Journal of Forecasting on stability and the inefficient use of forecasting systems, a case study in a supply chain company. And they, uh, they talk about how they had been working with this one company for many years, the software they adopted to improve their forecasting, the accuracy of the models increased, but the company's adoption did not increase. And that is because uh, the incentives that the individual planners had about whether or not to use the forecast versus their own intuition were not aligned. In other words, having a more accurate forecast, even though it was there, was not necessarily always in their best interest. So even if you have a more accurate forecast, if the company incentives uh, and process are not aligned, it may not, it may not have, uh, your better forecast may not be adopted. Another issue you can have is with algorithm aversion. I love this, uh, the work that uh, Deforce Simmons and Massey have done around algorithm aversion and their, their subsequent uh, papers on this topic about the fact that people are, are basically more forgiving of a human making a forecasting error than an algorithm. And so if they see algorithms making a mistake, they think the math is wrong. If they see a human making a mistake, they think the human made a mistake and they'll forgive it and expect uh, improvement the next time around. And so what we have to watch out for is if, because there are people are less forgiving of algorithms making a mistake, it may lead them if they don't trust the model to just stop using it. Uh, a third challenge of adoption, and Anne Floor mentioned this earlier, is failure of adoption. And I'm thinking of one of our uh, major customers and floors working with right now, where uh, if the business doesn't understand it, if the models are not interpretable, uh, they will not use them. And that's why, why uh, tools like SHAP or LIME or other ways of explaining uh, model results, especially for using any machine learning, uh, matter so much. They're, they're really critical to increasing the, uh, the adoption in the business. Uh, and for any comments do you have on, uh, on interpretability, since I know you, you spend so much time on that question? Um, yes, it's um, to put it in a simple words like that are coming from our customer, machine learning with ex without explainability will never work. That's a quote <laughs> that I, I, I heard. Um, in reality, the forecasting process is really just a number and everybody's like right sure you know like that makes total sense it's a very um it's a consensus driven process so we start with a number you will have a lot of teams that will have an opinion on what the forecast should be like the sales team the marketing team the product team and if there is no way for forecasters to explain why they forecasted what they forecasted why it's 150 it's very difficult for them to be able to speak with the different teams and, you know, um, um, it's not really negotiating, but at least discuss, review the assumptions, uh, make sure that there is an alignment and that it's understood what drove that forecast. So, yeah, it's, it's like one of the key things that we, we need to, to work on every single day. So Anne Floor mentioned another problem that can happen, and that's with model drift, where you set up your model and then things change, but you haven't uh, factored in the changes, and then the, the results start turning out uh, degrading in, the, in, their, uh, in their value to the business. I'm thinking of an example I know from someone I used to work with uh, in a large travel and tourism business, and they had a forecaster who built an excellent model he, he put in a bunch of seasonality factors and he was manually adjusting them. He also wrote the, the model in 
R, which at the time, uh, open source R, which at the time, not many people in the company understood. And uh, then he deleted some of the seasonality factors he had uh, added. He left the company. He had not documented his work. The forecast started to degrade. It res resulted in bad optimizations and pricing recommendations. This was a, a revenue management issue. And, uh, and it took them months to find the problem because uh, the forecasts were at a bid price level. And the executive told me it probably cost them millions of dollars uh, from, from this happening. So I would say this is a, this is a major risk. And don't underestimate the, the fact that other people may not know, even if you have skills in R or Python or something else, other people may not know it. I was at a conference recently, attending a virtual conference with a, uh, a very experienced demand planner who had worked at multiple brand name companies, big companies whose names you would have heard of. And so my point is that she was very experienced. She'd worked in multiple large companies with very mature processes. And somebody asked her something about Python and she said, what is Python? So my point in telling you that is that it's not that I would have expected this demand planner to know Python herself. I was surprised that at the maturity of companies where she was working, that she had that had so little exposure to Python that she had not even heard of it. And so, again, in the example I gave you a minute ago, the model had been written in R and nobody else knew it. In this case, uh, we have a planner who doesn't know anything, doesn't even know what Python is. So literally, she wouldn't even know who to go to to ask. So keep in mind that some of the fancier uh, approaches you have learned uh, in graduate school may not be as uh, useful in business every day. And that's because the math, I always call it the math, but the math is not the end of the line. So this is a depiction I like uh, picturing it as a subway map. Uh, and this is from the Certified Analytics Professional Program, which is just what it sounds like. It, it grants a certification in advanced analytics. And I won't go into the details, but I'll say we used, a, I was part of creating it, and we used a rigorous psychometric approach to choose these domains of analytics practice and then their, and their relative weighting of how much time in a given day uh, a, uh, an analytics or data scientist would spend on each of these problems. And, and just to echo what Ann Flores said earlier, uh, you have to start with framing the business problem. What problem are we trying to solve? And then figure out how we can reconstitute that problem as an analytics problem is the next step. Then you have to get the data. Uh, cannot underestimate this step enough. Uh, data scientists will complain about how much time they spend on the data. Do not assume that whatever data sets you've been given to use in graduate school are readily available. It is frequently the case that you, the data is very dirty, it's not available, you can't get it out of the systems, uh, can be a huge problem. Uh, sometimes I joke that here the, the steps I highlighted in red are the math, so which approach should we use? Uh, one thing to keep in mind from a business perspective is that the business people you are working with may often not recognize the difference between a forecast and a prediction. So not only do you need to pick the right approach to solve that business problem, and again, go back to the first step, what problem are we trying to solve? But you need to be able to make sure that they can understand whatever it is that you're uh, explaining. Then you have to build your model, and then you have to deploy it. And we'll talk more about this uh, in a minute, but uh, deploy it and maintain it. Uh, as Anne Floor mentioned, that can be a, a huge issue. And I just gave you an example of the model drift. If you don't maintain your models well, they will degrade, result in, in bad business outcomes, and can literally cost the company millions of dollars. Now, what I like about this quote here, this is from um, a supply chain leader I heard give a talk at a conference. He's a, a, a leader in Europe. And he, he said that planners translate trends for data scientists so they can understand the numbers and they can become stories. And I'm putting this quote on the slide because I want you to really value the information that a planner, even though I mentioned earlier the example of a planner who'd never even heard of Python. So she may not have the skills that you almost certainly all have from, from her extensive studies in, uh, in university what someone like that planner would have is she would know her business really well. She would know planning. She would know her, whatever it is she's forecasting. She would have a lot of knowledge and information. And so what, what Harry was saying is that she can take all the, that data that you're dealing with, all those numbers, and help turn it into stories. And you do not want to underestimate that if you're trying to understand uh, numbers in a spreadsheet, 
uh, that where the numbers come from, what they mean, how they connect involves a lot of domain expertise. The planner will have that. And even if they don't have Python expertise, they will have domain expertise. And that is critical. So the business people need to become your partners. So I'll emphasize this point again, that the first step in the process is framing the business problem. Uh, so I love this quote from Albert Einstein, who basically said, if he's trying to solve a problem, he's going to spend most of his time framing the problem, trying to figure out what is the actual question to ask. And so even if you know it's a forecasting question, you need to be very crystal clear on what, what, what exactly you're trying to forecast and what matters to the business, thinking about the stakeholders, what results matter, do they care about forecast accuracy? Do they care about just getting better information? Does, does it under forecasting or over forecasting that matters? Some of the considerations we mentioned earlier are all part of framing the business problem, identifying what the state, who the stakeholders are, what they care about, how they will use it. Uh, all that is essential. And just to give you more of a illustration of that, this is from a, a Google paper from a, a NeurIPS conference from a few years ago. I still love this paper and, and Anne Floor referenced this earlier. And this is, I really want to emphasize that this actually doesn't even cover all the steps of the analytics lifecycle. It just covers really the deployment of a solution. But what you can see here is there's a lot of steps around it. feature extraction, getting the data in shape. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about more and more these days around ML ops or ML engineering, the server, uh, monitoring the models. And what you can see here, because you can't even read it, it's so small, is that the math is only a small part. Uh, and so I emphasize the fact that uh, all those fancy math skills you've learned, very valuable. You're likely to be a minority of people in your organization who know them, and you're relying on other people, and the math is not the only part. And just to make this uh, even more clear, I love this quote from a uh, uh, somebody I've tried to hire twice in my career. He is a statistician and econometrician by training. He's currently, what you're seeing from his LinkedIn profile is that he's uh, He's a uh, professor of the practice now um, teaching at North Carolina State University, but he spent most of his career in industry, even though he has a, a PhD, uh, working in the healthcare payer and provider space. And I love this quote where he said that ordinary least squares logistic and cart helped him pay off his mortgage. And he, I commented, I had a correspondence with him after he quoted this. He was telling me he was teaching an honors undergraduate statistics class. And he joked that after six weeks, he could have sent them home because he felt like at that point they had learned enough of the techniques or models that would help them essentially pay off their mortgages. That, yes, of course, there were more things he was going to teach them and fancier things, but that most of what they'd be using would, the things that would pay off their mortgage that, that earn them money would be the simpler methods. And that has to do with, um, uh, with you know Occam's razor, or or I, I like the the slide here from um, Monica Rogatti, what she called the AI hierarchy of needs, and it's it's the same concept as what Vivek is getting at here. Essentially, that is simple is always better if you can. So remember that uh, while you can use neural networks, reinforcement learning, uh, whatever you want to play around with, Holt winners, simple regressions uh, often will do the trick, and and a simpler model is always better as a as Anne Floor mentioned, the more complicated your model is, it may be more powerful, uh, but it becomes less interpretable, which is a trade-off you have to manage. Remember what she said, the customer who told us that if it's not interpretable, it won't work. So not only does a more powerful and accurate model typically become more complex in terms of explanation, it becomes more complex in terms of deployment. And that, that chart I showed of the uh, Google implementation with all the boxes, the more boxes you put around it, the harder it is to deploy. So that's what this uh, hierarchy is getting at here, that you know you have to start off and just figure out where do you get the data and have it uh, piped and stored. Remember I talked about, I've, I've certainly had cases in my career where there was data I wanted, uh, the, the transactional system was collecting it, and it was so hardwired we could not get it out of the system. Then you have to clean up your data, uh, aggregate it, uh, train your models, uh, Try some simple, you know, some maybe you're trying some simple machine learning algorithms at, at this stage here, and only at the top would you get to AI and machine learning. So, in terms of skills, and uh, I know Anne Floor has seen this uh, herself because we've certainly talked about this. This is from a paper from the Informs Journal on Applied Analytics. I really like this paper, um, partially because uh, the professors 
used NLP to answer an analytical question. So they used more advanced methods themselves. They, they did a, a search, a, an extensive search of job ads. And what they found is that in terms of the skills requested for uh, data scientists or advanced analytics jobs, so this is not any jobs. These are, these are technical jobs using data science, machine learning, forecasting, advanced analytics. Uh, modeling skills ranked fifth. So the first and most important skill you can see by far that was expected for people in these roles was to communicate. Uh, if you cannot explain your models, so interpretability, remember interpretability has at least two parts. We have to have something like SHAP or LIME or something to actually get the results out of the model that someone can explain. And then people like you would be the ones who have to use those tools to be able to explain them to the end user, to the planner. Uh, so to the to the person in the business, if you do not have communication and interpersonal skills, that will make it much harder. You have to manage people. Uh, that's a critical part. People are what get things done. You do have to know a database, and then you have to understand the business. So I gave the example earlier of the the senior leader who said that uh, planners uh, turn uh, numbers into stories for data scientists. Uh, that's because they know the business. So it's important for you, no matter what business you go into learn your business. If you go into automotive, understand the drivers, read the headlines, figure out what's happening in the automotive business. It will make you much more effective. And finally, we get to the math skills here. So uh, you need lots of skills to be successful in business, not only the ones you've learned already, but a bunch of other ones. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to keep going here. And then uh, I know uh, I know in floor we'll have more to say. We'll, we'll have some time in the, in the Q&A. Uh, the last thing I want to say here on, on kind of the math itself is that uh, the failure rate of AI in organizations is very high. One study from MIT and the Boston Consulting Group found that only 10% of companies, it's a very frighteningly small number, only 10% of companies get significant financial benefits from AI. Uh, what they did said did make a difference. The, the key to getting those benefits was humans and models learning from each other. So organizational learning, figuring out how the, the models can learn from the people, the people can learn from the models, and change management. Change management, another one of those communication skills critical to making sure things are adopted. Uh, as we, as we, we, what we find when we're trying to get an organization to consider machine learning based models for the first time, it's not only around interpretability, it's around getting them used to the fact that they're going to be doing things differently and the change management on that. That's why I like to emphasize that there's, uh, if you can uh, uh, laugh at my wonky uh, drawing skills, I better stick to my day job uh, and my poor handwriting. You can see that I, I've uh, named four, four legs of what I call the data scientist stool. You have to have good technical skills. You need to be able to program. A demand planner may be able to get away with not knowing Python, but you probably can't if you want to call yourself a data scientist. You need to have the quantitative rigor that you all are learning and learning or have already learned in university. But as we've already emphasized, you need to know the business and you need to have interpersonal skills. So these are critical in order to succeed in, uh, in industry. So now I'm um, going to jump, just, just go ahead to give you some thoughts on uh, applying for jobs and then we'll, uh, and then we'll make room for, uh, for questions so that you, we can figure out what you're most interested in, in knowing. Um, so just uh, shifting gears here, uh, a few things we want to say about uh, applying for jobs. If you decide to look for a job in industry, uh, a few quick pointers here. Uh, keep your options open. Uh, make sure you focus your resume or your CV. And in my experience, a resume is more of an industry term. A CV is an academic um, term. So if you're applying for an industry job, they probably don't want a four-page resume with all the papers you published. They're not going to care about that. Pick two or three that are the most critical ones to illustrate that you can publish papers, but don't list everything. You want to research the company and make sure that whatever you, if you've done a ton of work in the automotive industry, but you're applying for a job in, in consumer packaged goods and you've written one paper on consumer packaged goods, don't show three papers on automotive. Show that one paper in consumer packaged goods. You don't want to make up anything or falsify any information because you're going to get asked about it. If, the, if you don't have the skills for the job, don't try to get it because it won't be a good fit for you or for them. If you see a company that you like and you're interested in, really interested in working there, don't apply for 10 jobs. Pick maybe two and stick to that and, and hope for the best. Okay, a few quick things, get ready, getting ready for the interview. 
you want to reread that job description and you should read it before you go. Now, I want to say a couple of things on the job description. On the one hand, don't apply for a job if they say required uh, five years of experience in um, pharmaceutical industry and you have no experience in pharmaceutical. Just don't apply if they say that that's required. But if they say something like, you know, preference uh, pharmaceutical experience, you don't have that experience, but you have most of the other things, apply for the job. Don't be afraid if you don't have all the skills to apply for a job. It's just you want to pay attention to what they do say are required. Um, read that job description and be prepared to speak to it. That's what they're going to ask you about. Research the company before you go and research the people you use LinkedIn or other tools to research the person interviewing you. You want to know a little bit about them and their background so that you, you show that you have an interest. And you want to come prepared to your interview with three to five questions about both the role and the company and the work they'll be doing uh, and, the, and how you'd help them. And remember that part of your role in an interview is to tell them not what they can do for you. Well, I'd like this job because it would help me develop my skills in X. You want to show them what you can do for them. How can you add value to what they're doing? A few other tips on the interview. Let it be conversational. You don't want to be too formal. You certainly, this is a chance you're being asked to talk about what you're good at. So be sure to take that opportunity. Don't be too shy. On the other hand, what, what sometimes happens is uh, somebody has read somewhere that it's important to show leadership and take over the interview. Do not do that. Uh, it always annoys me when people, when people do that. I have a certain set of questions I typically want to ask, so let the interviewer lead and, and ask them for what they need from you. And I really encourage you to take notes. It's okay to take notes during an interview. I like to see an, uh, a candidate who sent me a thank you note afterwards that references things we actually talked about, so I know they paid attention. So uh, kind of go through these next few slides just very quickly, but in terms of what companies are looking for, just keep in mind that there are two kinds of things for the kinds of technical roles you're more likely to be considering. They'll be looking at technical fit. Do you have those specific skills needed for the job? And they'll, they'll use a variety of ways to assess that. Um, some, some use, like I've seen programming tests, they'll ask technical interviews, or they'll ask you technical questions. You may be asked to give a presentation. But they're also going to be looking for a cultural fit. What matters in that organization? Do they care about you being a team player? Do they care about you having a sense of humor? Do they care about you uh, being concerned about, say, social benefit, if that matters to that organization? Whatever it is, pay attention to, uh, to that and their culture. Because remember, you're interviewing them just like they're interviewing you. If you don't feel comfortable in an interview, that might be a sign that's not a company for you. And finally, in order to understand the cultural fit, there'll be typically a common technique is to ask what's called behavioral based questions. And that's using something called the STAR method. And STAR stands for situation, task, action, and result. And there's a lot of words here on this slide, but what it really means is that instead of asking you something speculative, what would you do if you were given a forecast? The belief in these behavioral based questions is that we want to ask you about things you've done in the past so you can speak to direct experience because direct experience is a better predictor of the future. And so they'll be asking you to say, okay, tell me about a situation you faced in the past, what, what task you were asked to accomplish, what you did about it, and what results you got. And it's okay if your experience has been, if you're even if you're applying for an industry job and have never worked in industry, think about how you can transfer what you've done to industry roles. And I'd encourage you in advance to think about some of these stories you can tell so you're prepared. Uh, many stories you might have from your experience, maybe it was a project you worked on for a company as part of a practicum. Uh, whatever it is, the stories are transferable typically to multiple questions you might be asked, but you won't be prepared for that unless you've prepared the stories in advance. And uh, finally, um, I mentioned a thank you note earlier. I always encourage people to send a thank you note. Uh, if you can reference things that you talk about in the interviewer that reminds them that you uh, were paying attention. Uh, if they don't um, uh, follow up, you can send them a note to ask for an update, but don't don't write them over and over and over again. I'm hiring for two roles right now, and I can tell you that uh, the challenge is when you're hiring is that you're trying to do your day job plus hire, which is something else on top of that. And so pe people are busy, so don't panic if you don't hear something in three days. It may be weeks that go by before somebody hears from me. But if you don't get selected, feel free to reach out to the recruiter who often is interested in trying to help good candidates find jobs. I regularly get resumes from recruiters in our own company saying, we couldn't hire this person for this role, but they might be good for your team. Are you interested? 
and you can ask for feedback. Not every company is able to give it, but when they can, it's always good to ask. And the final thing uh, I'll say just to wrap this up here is that we're hiring at Canaccess. We are looking for people with uh, the kinds of technical skills many of you are likely to have. We encourage you to check out our careers page to learn about it and people matter to us at our company. And so culture is very important as part of our interviewing process. We also have a robust internship program. We have a variety of roles on our team. P people can work for uh, people like Ann Floor and our professional services organization in R&D, building the product like she talked about, and we have a, a great company. The last thing I'll say before, just two more slides before we, uh, we shift into questions, is that uh, uh, some of the things that we talked about today, uh, um, Magarechi referred to this earlier, we do have a robust academic program. And Floor and I have given guest lectures at universities. We, we've spoken to uh, 5,000 students in the last two years through virtual guest lectures. So feel free to, to reach out to us. And we also have uh, academic case studies we've developed. And if you want to learn more about the International Institute of Forecasters, who's the co-sponsor of this presentation, and the Early Career Researchers Program, here's the email address for them. And finally, I'd encourage you to reach out to either Ann Floor or myself and uh, follow us uh, connect with us on LinkedIn and also follow follow our company, Connexus, on LinkedIn to learn more about supply chain. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can take questions. So are there any questions, let's see, from the audience? Um, yeah, there is one question which is, um, give guidelines for uh, what career opportunities if we are located um, in India. Um, there are a lot of career opportunities if you're located in India for sure. Uh, Kinexis has a team in India uh, and we work so we have like um, at least in professional services we have basically like a, a regional groups um, who manage implementation including for uh, forecasting uh, locally and we also especially with the uh, like recent situation remote work has been uh, more and more common uh, so it does take to bridge certain uh, time differences um, but it's uh, uh, you have all the opportunities really uh, available uh, yeah for sure and I would say the same thing that is true for Canaxis is true for many companies. Many companies, just like we do, have a have an operation in India. And so uh, many of the kinds of industry roles that Anfor was describing, uh, those same companies will have operations in India. So, so uh, more and more, you do not have to come to the North America or Europe to, uh, uh, to get an excellent job in forecasting. Let's see, I'm looking at the next question um, on floor. What would be the main attributes of machine learning or AI when deploying within the business environment? So I'll let you go first and then I'll uh, also add some comments to that. Sounds good. And uh, so that's something that um, uh, Polly talks about a lot. So uh, I'm gonna give the framework that uh, Polly usually has because I find it really good. Um, it's basically what Polly calls the five eyes. And uh, so it really needs to be intelligent, right? It needs to provide that value add, that intelligence, uh, for example, through AI ML. Uh, there's also the immediate um, uh, attribute, which is like being able to be as real time as possible and, and on time for when the business needs it. And there's the inclusive, which is the third eye, which is uh, it needs to be consumable by everybody uh, you know, and we can't leave like key stakeholders out of of the the group. Like it needs to be understandable. Um, it needs to be informed. So business knowledge needs to be baked in. Um, I can give you another example where um, we had like a, a model where there was like an incremental key one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., and that key was correlated to another feature. And someone in, in my team came back and said, well, that incremental key, you know, is one of the top features for the model. 
it, it, it's not necessarily the case, right? So business knowledge, domain expertise is really important as they inform the fourth eye and the fifth interpretable, we talked about it. Um, so I don't know, Polly, if you want to chime in on this because uh, um, yeah, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that, that's certainly uh, true. And I would, um, with immediacy, for example, I would return also to agility. Think back to the example I gave from Unilever, saying that in the immediate aftermath of the of the of a disruption, say the pandemic, um, that agility was more important to them than accuracy in their forecasts. So, keeping in mind that uh, when we think about information we need, or organizations want better information, robust information to make good decisions, but better models are not the only part of make, uh, getting uh, better information. But the other part of deployment I would just speak to is what we talked about in terms of that chart we showed with the, uh, the math, the tiny box in the middle and all the other boxes around it. It takes a lot of infrastructure to deploy any model. And the more complex and powerful your model, the more infrastructure needed. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not worth it sometimes, uh, depending on the use case. But I often like to say you need to think about the right math for the right problem at the right time. Uh, Netflix famously paid out a million dollars, oh, maybe 10 years ago, for a, comp for a team that could improve the accuracy of their, um, get a 10% lift on their recommendation model. They paid out a million dollars and they never implemented the model because they found that the engineering to deploy the model was not worth, that it was going to be so expensive to Netflix that it was not worth them. The value they would get out of that 10% lift was not worth it. So keep in mind, you also have to manage the trade-off of if is the infrastructure worth uh, the value we'll get. It is the case that sometimes it is. So don't don't be discouraged. There are times when it is, but that's where that whole analytics life cycle matters because you have to think about every step. Uh, and for you want to talk about integrating human judgment into ML-based models, I think it's a great question. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so in in the forecasting, there is really like a fundamental aspect, which is consensus. Like it's, we, the, the forecasts need to be, uh, there, need to, there needs to be a buy-in from the different people using the forecast. Otherwise, what you will see is people will come up with their own numbers and will not use the results of the forecast. So incorporating um, basically like human judgment in ML, um, it can it's usually managed through the process itself, where you can have like um, multiple people contributing to which data needs to go into the model, to the choices, to the discussions, and have alignment on what it is. The interpretability is the key part where also human judgment gets integrated. And most softwares around forecast you will see will allow people to override. So um, ML is not necessarily great at forecasting for everything. You could have like some very highly contextual skews or some very erratic data. And at this point in time, the demand planner with the knowledge will need to override and Im to improve the forecast. That's another piece where human um, judgment gets integrated. And then the last piece is really the consensus for the final forecast, making sure that, you know, if sales knows that there's an unusual order, they saw like a crazy amount and that's never happened in the past, you want to include that as well, because that's probably something that didn't make it through the data to the ML models. So those are the three key points right now, like the most common that I see on including human judgment. Um, there are actually, um, there, there is um, a technique that Can Access is working on uh, um, that's going for a patent, which is called human in the loop. And that's basically a technique where the machine can also learn from human corrections. So that's the next generation, let's say, as we think of it, um, of integrating human judgment where the overrides and the different, you know, like the different actions that human will do to correct certain aspects, then the machine will actually uh, be able to integrate that metadata and learn it as well. Good, great answer. Um, I'm gonna shift gears for just a second. Somebody's asked a question around how do you deal with gaps in your CV or your resume? And so uh, the first thing I'd say is I talk to people all the time, people I have worked with in the past who have been fired, like fired for cause, uh, let go because there were uh, layoffs at their organization, uh, took time off to take care of an aging parent, took time off to travel around the world, took time off to have a child, 
Uh, there can be any number of reasons why you're out of the workforce for a while, and don't be ashamed of those. There's nothing wrong with any of those reasons, including if you got fired. It happens to very good people. So, uh, so what I always encourage people to do is to think about how you need to be your best self, bring that best felt self to the role. If the company doesn't want to hire you because you were fired or because you took time off to take care of your aging parent, they don't value that, that's not a company you want to go work for. Because if they don't value something that matters to you, you don't want to go work for them. So remember that um, one of the best things about looking for a job I've ever seen that's always stuck with me is that sometimes when you're applying for a job, if you were to keep a little tracker, it might be no, 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 yes. You only need the one yes to get the job you want. And so don't be discouraged if there are lots of no's. And the no's can be they said no to you. It could also be you said no to them. You didn't like the way they sounded. Uh, you didn't like the culture in the, in the interview. So if you have a gap in your resume, have a story, have an explanation, and have it. Don't be falsify any information. Don't pretend. Uh, talk about uh, even if you were burnt out, and that's happened more and more these days. Even if you were burnt out, have a story around that. But show show something positive and productive. So say I recognized that I was reaching a point where I needed a I needed a break. So I took. I decided to take. I'm making this up, six months off. Uh, I used the time to uh, build up my, again, I'm totally making this up. Uh, I, I wanted to improve my, my uh, programming skills. I took some Python courses on the side. I also took knitting because I really wanted to uh, take some really time away to reinforce what mattered to me in life. I took knitting and I took horseback riding lessons. And after I really refreshed myself with both new skills for my personal and my professional life, I felt like I was really ready to go back to industry and here's what I learned in the process. Something like that would be a, would be a story. So don't be afraid of gaps in the resume. Um, let's see. Um, and Flora, you want to take the next question? Uh, uh, the demand planning? Yes. Um, so I am into demand planning. My competency proficiency in the science part is not much. Should I go for it? Or stick to the art uh, part. So um, that's a really good question. Most of the time for demand planning, you're not required to be a data scientist. Um, however, um, it is becoming more and more important if you want to really go into forecasting to understand the principles behind it, to be able to recognize is there seasonality or not in my uh in my time series let's say or in my data um is it a new product you know that has six months of history and what do i change then in my forecast to be able to account for that so um my perspective on this is that you don't need to be a data scientist like i wouldn't necessarily go for you know like computer science and uh you know uh operations research or anything like that um, but I would certainly um, look into uh, a bit of the science, like to pair the science and the art in terms of what is useful for you every day as a demon planner, like such as the key questions in terms of is there seasonality, then I know that I would need to apply those models for forecasting to be able to have a good performance. Do I have explainability? Mm -hmm. I know this is absolutely needed for any of my forecasts. Any tool that I work with, I want to check what are the functionalities and make sure that I'm getting like the right information and insights about it. And pair that with your business knowledge, because at the end of the day, that will that will be like the, the scale that, you know, will be the most important, like making sure that it makes sense for your business, making sure you have the right story about your forecast and that you are able to discuss, uh, you know, constructively with all the other teams and your management as well uh, to get their trust and to get their approval. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for your excellent questions. And uh, we're going to ask Magarechi to, uh, to bring things to a close for us today. Uh, thank you all for coming. And especially in the name of EC, uh, ECR group, I want to thank Polly and Unflor for your time an excellent presentation and all the tips you brought to us see you and bye bye thank you thank you bye bye
Thank you. Thank you. Bye.